Well, guys, I'm glad that we're here today. And as we open the word of God, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here, a place to gather, a place that's warm, a place that's dry. But more than that, Lord, it's a place that you dwell within the hearts of every person here. Lord, I thank you for Grace Bible Fellowship for the body. I thank you for all of those who labor, for all those that make this happen. I'm so grateful for your spirit working your will in our lives and your word into the way that we live and work. I pray that you might encourage us today as we open your word, give us direction and inspiration that Jesus, you might be the prime example of how we should be and that you might help us to give you the worship and the glory that is due you. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice as you speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. This week, we're going to move on a little further in chapter nine. I, I didn't even get 13 verses done last week, so you can take that out of my pay, I guess. Um, <laughs> that's just the way I feel when I don't, I just feel inadequate. So I'll beat myself up so you don't have to. It's a, you know, that's a, that's a thing people do. You beat yourself up and nobody else will. But if you, but if you're all proud and full of yourself, everybody will beat you. Anyway, we're going to look a little bit further into Mark and we're going to see the compassion of Jesus Christ on children specifically and a couple other things sprinkled in there. But uh, Jesus has a special place in his heart for children. And I, I think that's awesome. But as we get into this, we're going to get into what we looked at last week, which was um, last week we looked at what's called the transfiguration where Jesus kind of emanated through his skin or perhaps a, a veil of time and space was peeled away and the three disciples were able to see Jesus in his real glory. And Jesus predicted that this would happen. He says in verse one of, of Mark nine, and he said to them, assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. I talked a little bit about how to study the Bible and pay attention to what's being said first. And then of course, what does it mean? And then how do I apply it? How do I take this to my life? So we see that there are some before they die are going to see the kingdom of God with power. And it's not strange, but six days later, that's exactly what happens. So within the context, it's already <laughs> defined. It happens at a place called Mount Hermon, which is right by uh, Caesarea Philippi. Uh, you can see the mountains, they have snow on them all year round. It's one of the only places you can go skiing in the summer. But, uh, and they actually have a ski resort up there, believe it or not. But this is not far from Caesarea Philippi. The mountain is uh, 9,232 feet tall. So if you're looking for a brisk uh, hike, uh, you, you can go there when, when, when you go. And so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. Uh, I, I always call them the special ed crew because you got to be close to people that go off like firecrackers. And I think that might have been part of it. But Jesus has those who are closest to him, who he confides in, and they get to see special things that the other disciples don't see. Uh, there was a healing that was done. It was Peter, James, and John who went in with Jesus. So you see these three guys, and I don't know if Jesus needs to just keep an eye on them. And so he's like, I can't leave you alone with the other guys. You'll, you'll incite a revolt. Uh, but the thing is, he gets transformed and... Uh, it's the same word we get metamorphosis from, and Jesus begins to change. His, it says that his vesture, his, his outer garment was bright like white, like whiter than anybody could ever get white with Clorox. And it was, it was a point at which we know that the disciples were there and they saw this. They were up and a little bit further away from the other nine disciples who were down at the bottom of the hill. And so this is a privileged thing. And of course, there's Elijah and Moses talking with Jesus about his exodus. It's rather interesting. You've got Moses who died a natural death and was buried on Mount Nebo. And you have Elisha, Elijah, who was not buried. In fact, he was translated. He was carried up. Um, you could say he was raptured, if you will. And he was carried away. So you have these two representing the law and the prophets. And of course... 
they were talking about Jesus going to Jerusalem to die. And I'm not sure how I would behave, but we looked at Peter's, he's like, Lord, it's good that we're here because we could build you three guys, three little booths, and we'll just stay up here. That wasn't exactly the reaction Jesus was looking for. Uh, in fact, he had just awakened from sleep because these guys notoriously fall asleep when Jesus says, pay attention. Uh, a lot like us. I don't know if you ever have trouble sleeping, pray. And, and once you empty your mind and you give it to the Lord, it's funny how, you know, snoring comes upon you. <laughs> but Peter, instead of saying nothing, which is what he should have said, says, it's good we're here. We see disciples doing that later when John the Baptist says, there he is, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus is now leaving from being baptized and he's going off alone. Two of the disciples decide, we're going to follow Jesus. It's silly because he knows exactly everything you're thinking, right? And so they're following at a distance and I could see them getting closer and closer. And Jesus swings around and says, what do you want? <laughs> and they go, uh, where are you staying? Is that really what you wanted to say? <laughs> it's one of those things when confronted with celebrity that you can just get tongue tied and say the silliest things. You ever do that? No, uh, you, you're, you're good people. And so I try never to interrupt Jesus. And Peter, unfortunately, interrupted this meeting. Uh, and he answered a question that was never asked. It says, then Peter answered. But he was never asked a question. Um, some people are like that. I tend to be that way sometimes. I'll answer a question when I was never asked, uh, asked one. So you, you, want to, you want to keep your heart back from speaking and sticking your foot where it doesn't belong. The Bible says that meddling in another person's affair is like picking up a dog by its ears. That's not what ears are for. Now, some of you moms might not think so. <laughs> you know, somebody's getting away from me and you grab that ear. How many, of you, how many ladies honestly have done that? You grabbed your kid's ears. Okay, good. All right, good. Confession time. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah, I usually tried for a wrist. Gives me a bit, bit more control, and then I won't feel bad if I rip their ear off. Then I'll feel terrible. <laughs> so wrist is usually a better, better deal. But he just, Peter just interrupts and answers a question that was never asked. And uh, God the Father makes a personal appearance. There's this cloud that overtakes them. And it's a white cloud. It's not a dark cloud. And he comes and says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. In other words, don't put him on par with Moses and Elijah. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Because Peter's always about interrupting, you know, just, just long enough to change feet. So the Lord steps on the scene and, and corrects Peter. And it says, as soon as that happened and I imagine as soon as he heard God the Father's voice, he was on his face. And the next thing you know, he looks up and it's all over. And Jesus says, come on, we got to go down. Just that quick. And you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And uh, Peter and James and John are on their way down the mountain. And I think that's probably about how far that we got last week. And it's interesting because God loves... Peter. And God loves you if you're like Peter. If you tend to shoot your mouth off, open your mouth and say things, you know, <clears throat> like somebody's, somebody says, well, isn't she a pretty girl? Well, yeah, she's as pretty as any of them. She just needs a nose job. <laughs> <clears throat> there are people like Kramer on Seinfeld that just tell the truth and they, they're not concerned about what might happen uh, when you say that. Um, that's a quote from the, from the series, sorry if you don't know it, uh, or I should say congratulations. But God loves Peter, even though he's impetuous, even though he's presumptuous, even though he shoots his mouth off and he answers questions he's never asked. He does take correction, and it's interesting because he's one of the first disciples that actually is martyred for Jesus Christ. And he had such a heart that he said, Look, I am not worthy to die like my Lord. 
And so they hung him upside down on the cross. And that's how he died, much quicker. And so I see that after Pentecost, Peter's changed in his heart, and uh, he's a changed man. He doesn't go back. And so as they came down the mountain, he commended his he commanded them, his disciples, that they should tell no one of the things that they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept his word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. You have to understand that rising from the dead, they didn't read the Bible. So they didn't know about Jesus rising from the dead in three days. But he did tell them several times, right? We're going to see again in this chapter, he tells them again. And they just don't seem to understand why God would send his son to come and suffer and die on a cross. It seems like an incredible failure, but it was a victory. Because without the innocent dying for the guilty, we would have no entrance into a relationship with God. But because he did, we're able to have a relationship with him. And so they walked away wondering what this raising from the dead thing is, and uh, because they just didn't get it. And they asked him, saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? They had just seen Elijah, by the way, so it's a natural question. Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and told them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. It's rather interesting. If you look at the tenses, he says, yeah, it's right. Elijah's going to come, but Elijah has come. Now, what's he referring to? Is he referring to what they just saw up on the mountain that he came? Is that the fulfillment of the prophecy, the, the prophecy we see in, in uh, Micah in chapter 3 and in um, chapter 1? He says, Elijah is coming, but he has come. Well, he certainly came up on the mountain. But if you look in the parallel passage in Matthew 17, Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. He's speaking future. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but they did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. You remember John the Baptist, the, the Pharisees came out and said, well, who are you? Are you the Christ? And he said, no. And they said, are you the prophet? Because there's a prophet prophesied that would come. And he said, no. And they said, are you Elijah? And he said, no. John the Baptist said he wasn't Elijah. Jesus says he was. So who are you going to believe? There, there are two different questions. They actually thought he was Elijah brought back from the dead. And that's the question he answered. No, I'm not Elijah brought back from the dead. But Jesus says that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so he is the Elijah, if you will. And he says in another place. So the Elijah that did come initially and was taken up into heaven, we see up on the mountain, sparks a conversation with them. It's like, well, before the end comes, Elijah is going to show up and he's going to make everything right. He's going to turn the hearts of the, the, the sons to their fathers and fathers to their sons. And I, I always think he looks like Hagrid, um, <laughs> John the Baptist. Let's his hair grow long, eats locusts and honey. He's out in the wilderness. He's wearing a, you know, a big leather belt around. His, he's, a, he's a big dude. In Malachi 3.1, the prophecy is here. Hold, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant. It's very messianic. In whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So he talks about an Elijah who's coming, who comes and ushers in the presence of the Messiah, who is Jesus. But that's not the only time. In Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. By the way, that's when God rolls out his judgment on this earth for all the things that Christ-rejecting people have done. 
And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Uh, those of you who are Bible students know that that is the very last verse in the Old Testament. And so the story ends with a curse. It's the very last at the very end. So it ends with a curse. And so they're all looking for Elijah to come. But not only that, Elijah will come. In Revelation 11:6, if you remember these two witnesses that God sends during the Great Tribulation as a witness against the people telling them to repent and give their lives to the Lord, it says that these have power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. That's one of them. It sounds a lot like Elijah, doesn't it? Because Elijah shut up heaven, or he just, the Lord said, tell him it's not going to rain for seven years. You know, it just so happens the Great Tribulation lasts for seven years. I'm sure it's a coincidence. <laughs> and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. That sounds a lot like Moses. <laughs> Moses and Elijah, we just saw them on the mountain, right? And we have two witnesses coming in the book of Revelation who do very much the same ministry as Elijah and Moses. And it says that they'll be killed, they'll lie in the street, and eventually they'll be translated right there in full view of everyone. So it's an interesting story if you want to go through Revelation and, and uh, you know, a little easy light reading before you go to bed. So that's what I should have finished last week. <laughs> in verse 14, and when he came to his disciples... He saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, at the, the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? You see, while the cat was away, <laughs> the scribes moved in with the nine disciples and they were having an argument with them. And so all the people are gathered around and the nine disciples that didn't get taken up onto the mountain because only James and John and Peter go, they're favored. Those nine guys were left at the bottom of the hill and there's this big disruption going on. And so Jesus is coming down and the people see Jesus and they're like, oh, finally Jesus is here. That, we don't care about the disciples, <laughs> which that really should be our priority <laughs> is running to Jesus first. And Jesus sees them arguing with the scribes. Now, these guys knew the Bible, the Old Testament scriptures, front and back. They would write it over and over and over. Not talking about journaling. I'm talking about copies. And if, if they made more than a couple of little teeny mistakes, they'd have to tear up the paper and throw it away. So these guys knew the word because they were in it all the time. And Jesus comes up and he wants to know, what are you guys trying to tell my disciples? Because I got to... I got to figure out what I'm getting into here. It's amazing. They were up on the mountain. There's all this light going on. Jesus is shining. You've got Moses and Elijah talking to him about his translation or his exodus on how he's going to die on the cross. And after that little summit at the summit, they come down and there's all this craziness going on. It's chaos. There's crowds. And there's critics. And the disciples without Jesus, they, they're a little out of their depth. They've got the, the, the high-minded, you know, Oxford graduates, Cambridge, you know, and they're really hitting them with a bunch of stuff. But the, we're not even told what it is yet. But what you get is conflict, crowds, critics, chaos, and catastrophe. Whenever G Jesus leaves, you know, I wonder if our lives are so much different than that. If Jesus isn't a part of our lives, I wonder if we don't have all of that self-induced by us turning from him. It happens. And so one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. So the kid couldn't talk. And by the way, uh, the language is such, the word is about someone who is young um, not of full age. So this is a child, not, not a teenager. <coughs> and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, gnashing his teeth and he becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples, 
that they should cast it out, but they could not. Imagine that. Some father walks in here with his young son and he goes, listen, my son's got a mute spirit. He can't speak. But the spirit, I know it's a spirit because it throws him down in the ground and he rolls around on the ground and he foams at the mouth and he's all rigid. <coughs> That's a spirit. I can imagine a father and a son coming up here and saying, Pastor Dave, I, I was out in the hallway with your elders and I asked them to lay hands and, and heal, heal my son, but they couldn't do it. So I'm bringing them up here right in the middle of your service. <coughs> Oh, I, 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 you know, what am I going to do? I don't know. It's interesting. Everybody has like a recipe on how that's to be done. And some people overstep the scriptural bounds of it. But he brings him to Jesus, which, by the way, is exactly where he should go. By the way, that's where we should go with all of our troubles, right? Yeah, amen. We should bring him right to the Lord. So I don't want any more counseling appointments with any of you people. Huh? <laughs> I'm kidding. So we've got this persistent father who gets through the, the roadblock of the crowd and also of the disciples, which couldn't help him. Apparently they tried. Now, if you remember previously, they did have power over evil spirits. They were casting spirits out. Jesus sent them out two by two and they went evangelizing and casting out demons and healing. And we saw that back a few chapters ago. So this persistent father is coming to Jesus because the disciples couldn't help he has this possessed son, for lack of a better word, and he's got a persecuted or a persecuted family. So this kid is a heartache to his mom and his dad and his brothers and sisters. And, it, it, you know, it, it happens when you have family catastrophes like that. It becomes kind of the, the lightning rod, you know, the centerpiece of all of your life. And that person tends to have everyone else kind of orbit them. You know what that's like? You know, if you have somebody that's older in age, sometimes they become the center, and, and that's right that we do that. Uh, sometimes you have a new baby, and a new baby is the center. You know, and sometimes you'll have a situation like this, although I hope not, or you'll have a wayward son or a wayward daughter, and they become kind of the topic of prayer and conversation. Well, he pushes through all that, and he finally gets to Jesus, but... The disappointment of the father is expressed in a hopeless complaint to Jesus. He's saying, you know, I, I did all that I could. I brought him here to your disciples, but they couldn't do it. I mean, do you, do you feel the depression in his heart? I know a lot of people I'll have a conversation with and I'll say, you know, are, are you a Christian? And they say, yeah, but I don't go to church. I don't go in for any of that. It's like, oh, really? Well, why is that? Well, the church is full of hypocrites. It's all right. We got room for one more. <laughs> but you get people that say, yeah, I went to church and they did some stupid thing. And it's, uh, you know, I, I don't want anything to do with church because it's full of imperfect people. Is that a right statement? Yeah. It is. <laughs> but God works here like he doesn't work anywhere else. Amen? Amen? I agree. You get people like this guy who says, you know, I went to the people of God and they couldn't help me. You know, they fell down on the job. They couldn't give me what I needed. And, you know, and they call those people church hurt. They walk away from church hurt because of usually relationship. Some relationship they can't mend, something they can't forgive, something they can't, don't want to lay down. And that's usually what happens. So, um, but if you're always mending those things, and if you're pre-forgiving everyone, which I would advise you to do, pre-forgive people. My wife pre-forgives me, which gives me a lot of liberty. <laughs> Not to do stupid things. And hasn't Jesus pre-forgiven you? Amen. Did he take all your sins or just the ones up to this point? He took them all away. And so we're free. Not free to go do stupid things and, and heap up, you know, uh, more sacrifice, you know, that's not it. But we're free. We're truly free because of God's love and his grace. This father is not free yet, and he's unhappy. The failure of the disciples must have been evident on their faces. I can imagine Jesus comes down. What are you talking about? Oh, well, I tried to get your, get your disciples to, you know, cast this out of my son. They couldn't do it. 
And I, I, I can see Jesus just look over at the disciples and they're like. <laughs> or maybe they do what they usually do and they point at each other and they blame the other one. Well, he wanted to use water. Well, he wanted to spit in his eyes. You know, like I can imagine all the conversation about how they would do it. And, and the, oh, I saw Jesus do this once. Let's try that. You know, let's try a two by four. That'll do it. Knock them right out. You get people have crazy ideas about how God works, and they don't necessarily take it because God revealed himself in the scriptures as this is what he does. And they don't go to him and ask him. They try to come up with their own plan. And that's why we fail. We fail because we don't, we're, we're too connected to this world and not connected enough to the Lord. So I've come and tried to, to get your disciples to do this, and they couldn't. And he answered them, and he said, oh, Faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. <coughs> really, Jesus? You're going to throw a guilt trip like that? Isn't that what it sounds like? It's like, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, this church. Oh. You guys can't even sit down in time. I mean, look at the time. Look at this. Jesus is weary because of the lack of faith. You'll always see Jesus disappointed when there's a lack of faith. He's never disappointed when a sinner shows up. He's never bent out of shape. In fact, he looks for an opportunity and, and he loves those people. It's the proud people, the proud ones that come up, the Pharisees who think they don't need what Jesus has. It's those where Jesus lays into them because that's what they need. They need to be broken. But here, Jesus is just expressing, guys, what happened? You, like Peter, when he fell, when he was walking on the water, and finally he looked around, and he sunk, and he said, Jersey version. What happened? What's up with that? You were doing well. Where's your faith? It's always Jesus disappointed that people don't believe him. Do you feel that way? You tell somebody something, they go, I don't believe you. No, I don't believe you come home from work and your wife says, what happened to the car? And you say, nothing. Well, I don't believe you because it's missing a bunch of parts. Like what happened here? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't see anything. It, it, it's not like that. You see, Jesus tells us the truth and we just don't buy it. We don't believe it. And he's disappointed. Oh, faithless generation, how long will I be with you? And I, I always have this particular pose, you know, this exasperated Sort of, you know, oh, I can't believe I'm going to have to do this again. <clears throat> and Jesus says, bring him to me. Well, that's, Jesus goes from, you know, the good grief stage. And he goes right to the, bring him to me. So if it appears as though he's going to do what this father wants him to do. So he brings his young son to him. I, I don't know what it is. And then they brought him to him. They brought the child. The, the man brought the child to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell to the ground and he wallowed around, foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Well, he at least finally got to Jesus, which, by the way, is the place you want to go. You can't put that kind of trust in anybody else but him, right? In 1 Peter 5, 6 to 8, we're exalted. Uh, we're, we're told to humble ourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. It says, cast all your anxiety, all your cares on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of a sober mind because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And we have a story of a young man who is, is being eaten up by this evil spirit. And Jesus is going to cast him out. And it's interesting, as soon as the man gets the son and brings him in the presence of Jesus, the demons just freak out in this kid. And suddenly he's down on the ground and he's having an episode. It's all happening right in front of Jesus. I, 
It's such an interesting study. If you look into the Old Testament and you look at fallen angels and you look at demons, it's very interesting. Demons really desire to inhabit flesh. They don't inhabit like, you know, your car's cursed or your house is cursed or, you know, or your shoes because they hurt your feet. You know, none of those things are, are able to be possessed, but they desire to fill flesh. It's an interesting thing. Uh, anyway, I'm, I, I realize I'm off topic. Forgive me. Peter says that we should humble ourselves and trust in the Lord. And here's this father who's bringing his son before Jesus. I want you to take note of this last verse. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. What's he asking? If you can, and if you care. Wow, that, that kind of hurts, right? If somebody came up to you and said, listen, there's a, there's a problem here, and I'd really like you to help out if you care, or if you're able. Does that sound like somebody that has a lot of faith? Absolutely not. He's been disappointed. It's usually people that have lost their faith. It's not that they never had it. It's they had it and they misplaced it. And unfortunately, it's usually in other people and other people let them down. And so he says, but if you can do anything, can Jesus do anything? Oh, Jesus can do anything. And does he have compassion? We've seen over and over and over Jesus has compassion. So it's rather like a slap in his face, right? It's almost like a passive aggressive manipulative thing. Well, if you're really... If you're really who you say you are, you could just do this in a snap, right? It almost sounds that way, but I don't think it is. I think he's really expressing his heart, that he doesn't know if Jesus can or if he's willing. A lot of our prayers are that way, aren't they? Lord, if it be your will, and if you feel like it, here's this thing. How would you like me to pray for you like that? Bless all these people, if you want. I pray that you deepen their relationship with you. I don't know, maybe they don't deserve it. So, no. Is that praying? I mean, is that really praying? No, that's not praying at all. Anyway, Jesus says to him, if, he gives it the same word back to him, biff, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So he's a man of two minds. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. That's a good, that's a good thing to put in there and not enter him anymore because they might try sneaking in the back door. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And as he came out, he was like one who's dead. So many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Jesus, first of all, gives the, the man an if back. He says, well, if you, you know, if you care and if you, if you want to and if you can. And he goes, well, if you believe. It's interesting. It was like a little tennis match. You know, the guy hit the if to Jesus and Jesus hit the if back. <laughs> if you believe. Anything's possible if you believe. I, I believe, kind of. Help me with my unbelief. How many of you identify with this guy? <laughs> Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I, I, I believe that you can, but I don't know if you would. I believe that you could do it for anybody else, but I'm not sure if you'd do it for me. Any of you struggle with that? Amen. You know, God doesn't love you any less than he loves anyone else. He loves us all the same. He's a good father that way. So if you believe... <laughs> Faith and doubt both mixed together. One of them will win. One of them will win. So he goes from this terrible torment to this tender touch. The, the boy drops down. When Jesus saw the crowd coming and he goes, I, I, I better get this done before the crowd shows up. He doesn't want to do it for the crowd. He wants to do it for the boy and his father. 
He doesn't want to do it for a show. So he begins to see people coming. He says, I, I got to get this thing done. I'm, he was having a teaching moment with the father. You know, if you believe, you know, all things are possible to the one who believes. And he says, I, you know, and they're having this spiritual conversation. And Jesus says, oh, it looks like we're out of time. The people are rushing us. We got to go. And so he casts the demon out and the demon shakes this kid violently kind of on the exit. And then he lays there as though he were dead. And you imagine the father depression now. I brought my son to you and now he's dead. But it says Jesus grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Well, that's a rather interesting word to describe that. He arose. Could it be that he was dead? Could be. Could be that he was just violently uh, taken out for a minute. Either way, it was Jesus touching him. We see Jesus touching everybody. By the way, Jesus is a touchy guy. I'm convinced he's a hugger. <laughs> Just because we are. <laughs> but Jesus touched people. There's a lot of, so he touches this kid and he goes from this crazy wild torment to this tender touch that raises the boy to his feet and the father gets his son back. So they take off from there. And when they had come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? That's a pretty good question. So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And then they departed from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know it. So Jesus has this little secret seminar with these guys, you know, I could see the nine disciples arguing probably with the other three and the other three saying, if we were here, we could have done that. And the disciples say, well, listen, we tried everything. We spit in his eyes. You know, we, you know, they, we tried everything. And so they wanted to know why. I mean, don't you want to know why? Like when a prayer is not answered or your ministry fails or something falls through and you had high hopes, don't you, don't you want an answer for that? Well, you know, God's got big, giant shoulders, and he can afford for you to ask those questions. And he's not afraid to give you an answer if you really want one. And so Jesus tells them, well, this one does not come out except by prayer and fasting. It's an interesting thing, the whole spiritual world that we know very little about and that the Bible gives us glimpses of as it goes through. But there are things that we just don't know. I know that there are angels who are doing God's bidding. I know that there's supernatural things happening in an unseen realm in which we only get to see glimpses of. And Jesus tells us something about this demon, this spirit, and he says, this one only goes out by prayer and fasting. Well, let me ask you a question. When did Jesus fast in the story? He didn't. When did he pray in the story? He didn't. At least it's not recorded. So what does he mean by this only goes out by prayer and fasting? Prayer is that which connects me to God, right? And fasting is what causes me to disconnect from this world. Jesus had a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. Amen. It wasn't just, you know, ooh, it's Lent. I'm going to give up Twinkies, you know. That's not the kind of fasting. Jesus went for 40 days and 40 nights out in the wilderness without eating anything. That's a fast. I don't recommend that. But for you to loose the things of this world and draw near to God and replace your physical meals with a spiritual meal, I can guarantee you that the Lord will meet you in that place. If you've got something you want to break in your own life, You've got a prayer that you think isn't answered. Could it be that the Lord just wants a little more of your attention? Amen. Could it be that he's allowing this to happen so that you might draw closer to him? I find that happens quite often. Recently, I blew my back out and uh, I couldn't stand up straight. <laughs> and, I, I was, <laughs> and it hurt all the time. And I would be able to stretch it out and then I'd be able to be up. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, 
I can't even sit up. I had to sit down, had to grab a seat. You know, I'm asking the question, Lord, why did this happen? Because I, I work hard days sometimes and that will take me out. But that wasn't the reason. I just woke up that way. You guys ever have that happen? Are you kind of old like me? And I was like, Lord, why? And it's like, why do you need to know? The question is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to behave with that thing? Are you still going to call out to me? Are you going to spend time with me? Are you going to replace this time where you'd otherwise be busy running here and burning there? Are you going to spend it with me now? Or will you continue to try to be busy shaped like a question mark? And sometimes we don't know how to shut it off. We live in Jersey after all. <laughs> if you're not producing money, I don't know how you live here. You, you got to you gotta run, you got to go, you got to do. You gotta, and there's things and people and places and projects. This is all happening. You guys have this in your life? You, you all look so at peace. I'm, I, I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> life is busy. And you have to be careful that life doesn't run you. Jesus said, this one doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting. Prayer, drawing closer to your connection with God. And fasting, getting less of a connection with this world. So that is what I think Jesus was talking about. And it's interesting, he didn't rebuke them in front of people. He didn't say, you guys couldn't do it. Come on, what's wrong with you? You know, like a baseball coach or something might do. Jesus didn't do that. He waited until they were alone, and then they asked the question. And so he reproved them in private. And he goes, guys, it's not your fault. It's okay. You just weren't ready for this. You're a little too connected to this world and not connected enough to heaven. That's essentially it. So he does that. If, if you ever want to say something of, of a praise, you always want to do that publicly. We actually had a lunch here yesterday. How many of you guys were here at lunch yesterday? some public praise going on, some thanks for all of that you guys do, uh, everybody that serves here in the body. And you always want to praise people publicly. If you're ever going to reprove somebody, don't do it publicly unless it's a public thing you need to take control of and you need to deal with it. Um, do it privately. It's easier for people to listen when you don't have a spectator, right? Right? And so it says that Jesus departed and he went and he passed through Galilee. He didn't want anyone to know it. So Jesus is kind of sneaking around because wherever he went, there would be these crowds. And Jesus had his face set like flint. He set his sight on going to Jerusalem to give his life. And he wasn't about gathering crowds and, you know, giving interviews and all that kind of thing. He was going to the cross. He made it his goal. Verse 31, for he taught his disciples and he, he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise on the third day. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. This is the second time in this chapter that Jesus is trying to get through to them saying, guys, this is the way it's going to go. This is how it's going to go down. And they're like, I don't know what you mean. It seems plain, right? Yeah. Which just goes to show you they're as big a knucklehead as you and I. <laughs> they're, they're not necessarily worthy to be put up on your dashboard with a little bobblehead. You know, they're just as bobbleheaded as you and I. Saints. So, fear and failure. They did not understand and they said, this is what's going to happen. And I'm comforted to know that the disciples were just like you and I. And sometimes they were a little slow on the uptake. You know, have you ever gone through something and you've had to go through it multiple times? And it's like, oh man, I can't believe I have to do this again. Well, apparently one time isn't enough for some of us. I'm one. Sometimes I need something three times or four times. And I tell my wife, hey, sometimes you got to remind me three and four times. She does this with my vitamins. She puts them out on the counter for me with water. And then she watches. 
Because she doesn't want me to die. That's so sweet, isn't it? And it's funny, if I come home and I don't find the water and the pills, I wonder, does she love me anymore or not? But she's very faithful, I can tell you that. Verse 33, and when he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? And they kept silent. For on the road, they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, you know, head of the class, in charge, top dog, he shall be last of all and the servant of all. Jesus is now going to teach them. And he goes, listen, what were you talking about on your way? And they said nothing, which is what they should have said earlier. But when Jesus asked them a flat out question, they were embarrassed to tell him. They were arguing about who's the greatest. Now, I know none of you people ever get into conversations like that. You know, who's your great? Who's your favorite? Or who's the greatest? Well, everyone knows it's Muhammad Ali because he said so. <laughs> but just saying so doesn't make it happen. And Jesus said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. If you want to be the greatest, I, I sit down. I have to have a conversation with you. And it's like he caught them with their hand in the cookie jar. It's like, what, what were you talking about? I wasn't going to grab a cookie, really. I, I, no, I'll put the lid on. I'm putting it away. You know, I don't know if you were a little kid that had a cookie jar. We had a cookie jar. And you can get caught with your hand in it. And they got caught. And Jesus said, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last and the servant of all. That's very different than our world, isn't it? If you want to be first, you need to be smarter than everyone else. You need to be stronger than everyone else. You need to be dressed impeccably. You need to have uh, excellent verbal skills. All the stuff that would fill your resume, right? And that's how you become the greatest. How big's your house? What kind of exotic car do you drive? How many children can you manage? These are things, these are metrics that people measure one another's greatness on. Jesus said, you guys are way off. Who's the lowest person? Who's the one that does the dirty deeds? Who's the one that will stoop low? That's where you find the greatest person because they have nothing to prove to anybody. They're going to be content in and of themselves between them and God. And it doesn't matter if they're cleaning the toilet. By the way, we got a number of people here to clear, clean our toilets. After some of you messy people. I think they're the greatest. I get people that are always... Joe DeJesus. Have you met Joe DeJesus? Where are you, Joe? Where is he? Is he wearing camouflage? Where is he? I'm going to try to praise him publicly, and he's not here. Where is he? I want to tell you what. That guy, he comes to men's breakfast like an hour early. And men's breakfast begins at 7 a.m. on a Saturday. He came an hour and 15 minutes early to Thursday night Bible study. You know why? Because he cleans the floors. He gets coffee makers filled with water. He's running around. And that brother, you, you won't hear three words out of him. Amen. Jesus says, do the lowest thing. You guys know Pete Marino? Yep. He's kind of a new guy. Yeah. <laughs> Pete's a new guy. You don't know what he does. Because I don't know what he does. I mean, I see the fruit of his work, but I have no idea how he does it. But I'll tell you what, he's, he's, a, he's a miracle worker, at least for our social media. And um, because of him, there are, you guys see these little shorts? Yes. Yes. Pete puts those together. He puts all the text on it, and he decides what's good and what's not so good. And I, you know, I, I couldn't do that. Praise God. You get people like Carl Vitale. He comes here. He's quiet. Hey, how you doing? He's quiet, <laughs> unassuming. But you know what? He's the greatest because he's serving behind the scenes. You have Dino who's back there running the machines. You got 
you've got ladies right now teaching in Sunday school class, the children, teaching them and pointing them to Jesus. We, there are lots of people. We've got Dan Martin who cuts the grass. We've got uh, Randy who, who fixed the, ga the, the, the gas guzzler in the back. Um, there are people that do these things all underneath, and you don't see Darren, another quiet guy, running around doing anything that, that needs to be done. All the, the ladies that are in the kitchen and getting the food ready and heat it up and out and clean up after you. And, oh, my goodness. Jesus said, you want to be great? Be the lowest. Don't be the one that you, you have to have everyone around you serving you. You serve everybody else. That's how you're great in the kingdom. And that's the way God measures things. I would continue on the five things that Jesus says about being great, but we've run out of time, which I do on a pretty regular basis. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We have another song for you. I hope you guys are enjoying walking through a day in the life of Jesus and seeing all of his teachings. As he gets closer to Jerusalem, he's going to teach more and more and more. And we're going to have larger and larger sections of Jesus's teaching because he's leaving this to the disciples. He's leaving the church to human beings and he wants them to know. So stay tuned. <laughs>